cliffhangers, man. These cliffhangers are going to be the fucking death of me. I swear to God. Like, I couldn't even enjoy Styx Helix. It's my favorite ending of the fucking season, and I'm sitting there just like, fuck, not even listening to it, because I'm just like, I would have traded the opening and ending both just for another minute or two of the greatness just to get a resolution to what's fucking happening right here. Subaru going in at the end, dude, that sword slash from the sky. He like, Rem, smile, dude. That shot was absolutely beautiful. Like today, I'm fanatical like a real demon, just going in like a monster. And I have to say, my boy made me proud throughout this entirety of this episode. He went in, and from the very beginning, if you watch the live reaction, you'll see I gave a round of applause because I was so overjoyed that there was no returns. It was indispensable. Like, if there had been a returns, I'd be raging like a fiend right now. But the development, the progression we get with this episode, really building up and giving us more exposition for Rem and Ram's character, which, dude, the feels for both of these girls right now. Like, it, it, every week, uh, yes, Goddess Leotan will always remain at the top, but every week the rest of the girls are just shifting positions for my second best girl. I, I love every single female character in this series. I'm going to say that right now. My best boy, Subaru, every, everything he feels for each and every one of them. I feel the same, but this episode, the feels for Ram and Ram, just wanting to protect them, that wink that Ram gave, dude, Ramji is fucking amazing, Ramji was fucking amazing this episode, and Ramrin just in that berserk state, simply because, the, the words that she said, when you saw her trudging through the forest, you know, pseudo-demon mode, going in in her only form, and she's like, I, I'll sacrifice you myself, no one else needs to get hurt anymore. No one else needs to feel this pain. And I was like, yo. All to protect Subaru. That dialogue at the beginning with Beako where she's like, yo, so you're just gonna give up? No. And, and that's the thing. I felt so bad. I felt so crushed because I was so overjoyed. I was enjoying the comedic moments, you know, seeing Ram get some shine and everything like that, that I didn't even think about where Rem was until Subaru had that moment of shock. But let, let's, let's get into it. Let's get into it. ReZero episode 10. I, I honestly, I just needed one more minute. Like, fuck the opening. We could have dropped that just to get one more minute of this episode. But I guess it was nice to have both the opening and ending, you know, together simply because it's only a couple more episodes till we get to the second core and they shift up. So I just got to enjoy them while I last, even though I've listened to Stick Helix so many fucking times that it's insane. But regardless of that, this is also the final week of the delays, which you They've been killing me. It's going to be so nice to be back at that 1.30 time slot going in with ReZero Sunday afternoon because these delays have been destroying me. Um, as far as the live reaction goes, still continuing with the format that we had last week until everything clears up. So this, this week might be the last week of that or next week for sure will be the final week of that. Please support the live reactions during this time if you want to see them continue and not just the reviews. But with that said... Let's dive back into it. First of all, first thing I want to say, just, just on the comedic side of things, my boy Puck, dude. My boy Puck is, dude, when he was making those munch gobbling sounds, just roaring at the man in his face, I'm just like, Puck is fucking amazing. Puck is like, but Puck, the thing about Puck is his banter and the dynamic of Subaru. I love all the dynamics between Subaru and the rest of the characters, but when it's Puck, it's just so fresh and vibrant and pure hilarity and comedy, dude. And I love that. Just to come off of that, come off of the tension and the apprehension I had off of that dirty ass cliffhanger from last week and see something like that, see Subaru resting in bed and Goddess Leotan by his side sleeping there, not, not even moving from his side. I'm just like, this scene is nice, dude. And I love the dialogue from Puck where he's like, this time you produce results equal to the effort invested. I'm not even gonna lie. And, I, and it, it's a statement like that honestly kind of makes me feel like Puck has a, a greater understanding of the situation than he's letting on, which is something I speculated, you know, about earlier on and potentially going back, and if you don't know about these theories, you have to go back to my episode 8 review, I believe it is, where I talked about them as far as the Satsula and Amelia theories and everything like that and the various branching possibilities, Puck's involvement, whether he'd be aware or not. This kind of is, is a little bit of shade in that category um, if you want to read into it. I mean, I could be reading too much into it. Uh, I could have no significant significance as far as that's concerned, but 
I thought it was interesting. Either either way, dude, I feel as though we finally hit a checkpoint, and then it's straight up moot because of the fact that he's been cursed by these Ugarm, which we find out the technical term for this actual breed of Maju, of these mobbies, called Ugarm, that these, these canine fiendish little beasts led by that little mutt that I just want to strangle, dude, manipulating everybody in the village, causing these problems time and time again with the curse. I'm just like, you yeah, destroy this. And clearly it has its own agency outside of Sasala, but it was interesting, really fucking interesting, before we talk about Rem and Ram and, and everything else, it was really interesting to see Subaru's tactics in this episode, dude. It was incredible to see him using the parameters of Returns by Death and this curse, and he, knowing that he's restricted from actually telling anybody, uh, otherwise he feels physically the repercussions of the cur whatever it is that's restraining him by the Wisata, that that fucking dark claw that we see during the returns time and time again, creeping up, you know, on him, constrained and restrained by Satala's influence, and that in turn, you know, clicked with the instincts of the Maju as well as Remen and bolstered the scent of the witch that's on him, drawing all of them to him as bait. I'm just like, dude, only my voice, dude, dude only my. My best boy can be absolutely hilarious just clowning and trolling while all the while having a legitimate and real strategy that actually went in and, and, and goes in his hardest and tries his best at every single moment regardless of the outcome or, or his fears or anything like that. That's why, this is why he's my best boy this season, dude. Done. This is why this man is too real and why I resonate with his character so much, dude. But that aside, I, I found that tactic interesting, but going back to what I was saying about the Maju and the Ulgarm and everything like that, we find out that these curses can be kind of embedded um, and basically they're devouring the mana of the person that they, they implant these curses into. Even Bayako can no longer remove it at this point because of how deeply embedded and, and intricately weaved these curses have been. The only way to stop it is to slay this entire pack of Maju that have, you know, feasted on Subaru, and I, I'm guessing the little ringleader little mutt that, that's leading them all, which... Going back to what I was saying about Maju and how they operate, whether, you know, what, the reason for their creation by Satala to begin with, and, and thinking about the Amelia theories, you know, I'm being one of the main proponents of the, of Amelia and Satala being one of the same, whether it's subconscious, whether it has a temporal rem to it and she hasn't actually become Satala yet, you know, whether it has to do harkening back to the legends of the hero, the sage, and the dragon sealing her away but not being able to destroy her flesh, therefore, you know, her actual awareness of being Satala has waned and she no longer knows what the fuck is going on, or maybe she does in fact know, which adds a whole nother realm possibility, but either way, the fact that Satchla is shaped in these tales, having slayed the other witch and everything like this, as a villainous and evil presence, could be misconstrued just because of the fact that people don't actually know the truth about her, and she could actually be a good force. But it's interesting to see that these Maju seem to have their own kind of sense of awareness and agency outside of that, but I wonder if they'd be subservient to Satchla if she actually commanded them, and or if somebody else can have control over them. That was just something I brought up last episode, and getting more into the little garment, the curse in, in this episode, I wanted to bring that up and readdress it as well as kind of briefly touch on the Sotola theories if you guys haven't heard of them yet. But going back into them and Ram, dude, first of all, and I, I want to say something before, because this is the only bit of shine my, my goddess, my best girl Leotan gets in this episode, where we find out that she's spent, she's passed out because she drained all of her energy, all of her mana up down to her Odo, you know, Puck says, which... I, I have to keep that term in mind as well. I wonder, you know, what that... I, I'm guessing it's a sense of spirit or her core, whatever it may be, um, just to save Subaru and to, and to heal him up, and she's been by... So this, is why, this is why she's absolute love, dude. That's why Leotan is absolutely amazing. But going back to Ram, that wink at the beginning of the episode after she shoved the, student, uh, shoved the food into Subaru's mouth. It is absolute love. It was completely adorable. Um, we find out about the clairvoyance ability that she has as well as her strong affinity for wind magic. Um, the clairvoyance ability is beast, dude. If you really think about how it works and the radius that it seemed to have, and I have to say this right now, the battle animation in this episode and the colors and aesthetics and stylization because the clairvoyance beam and that, that that kind of ripple sonar effect and the radius that it has able to see through the eyes of the hawk and all the creatures in the forest i'm like that is a fucking beast ability especially with the range that she has on it but rem you know, remnant going in in oni form yet again i could watch her slay these fucking beasts all day dude the fight choreography, the fluidity of the animation. She at one point she's in the air with the flail. She just bounces off of it and comes out. I'm just like, yo, it, it's too fucking savage. It's too real. But 
Getting back to Damchi, dude. Getting back to Damchi. That ability is be seeing her utilize the wind magic was amazing. But we finally get more insight into this kind of their background as demons and then the Oni and what happened. Harkening back to what Rem said during episode seven before she slayed Subaru, where she was like, the I, I will never forgive the witch Sasuke for what she did to my sister, which I, I don't know if it was a direct influence of that, especially with that brief glimpse we got into the flashback, it only almost looks like Rem herself was forced to remove her sister's horn. But either way, that shit got sliced clean off. She's disparaged as a hornless demon. She has no, you know, no ability to tap into her demonic powers because the horn was all that channeled that. And on top of that, we find out about the discrimination against them because most people born to the Oni clan are born with two horns, twins, share their demonic you know power and each you know possess one horn so they on top of her being hornless they were already disparaged and looked down upon for that status normally as as ram says they're killed at birth if they're born like that it's, it's disgusting to them it's a defect similar to how amelia I, I assume is looked down upon for being a half elf as well and just the general stigma of half elves in many fantasy kinds of realms so i found that incredibly interesting to learn about and it just heightened the feels for these two characters for me and then and deepen their bond as siblings especially with ram's burning desire to save her no matter what ram even pausing and snapping out of her her fucking demon trance just her rampage berserker mode to just to catch ram in her arms which dude when subaru threw her when subaru threw her I was just like, this is fucking insane. This is absolutely insane. Then I caught a glimpse of, of her pantsu, which I, I'm not even gonna lie. I'm not even, I'll admit that I was that I had a keen eye on that. I was like, yo, black lace, quite quite nice, Ram, quite nice. But anyway, I digress. Um, the progression of the episode, the pacing, it just felt so quick, so fast, dude. And it really built up my love for Ram's character, as well as deepened my feels for Ram's character. Because for those of you that don't, don't know, right now, currently, Rem is my f second favorite female character after Goddess Leotan. It goes, right now, I'll rank it for you guys right now. For me, personally, my best girl list of this series, I would say right now, it shifted a bunch. But Leotan at, at top, always number one, my goddess. Um, Remren, number two. And then I would say that it's currently a three-way tie between Bayako, Ramji, and Elsa. And then Felt at the bottom. We haven't seen Felt in ages. And I, it's gonna mean, I wonder if they will be in this this much vaunted and crazy third arc that I've heard so much about. But please, nobody spoil me on anything that's about to transpire. Um, I, I don't want to know. I really don't want to know. Um, aside from that, Bea, the, the dynamic between him and Bayako, yet again, I forgot, I glossed over this. Um, and him just, that one line where he's like, I feel like I've known you four times as long. I really like that line as well. Um, just the, the dialogue in this episode was amazing as well as the feels that I, that I felt for Rem and Ram and that kind of spirit that each one of the characters possessed and was shining through with this episode. One thing that I did notice was when we we're at the village and it was so great to see their adoration for Subaru um, at, at the village and everything like that and him having been able to keep his promise to them, the villagers giving him a blade for you know to show their thanks, Ram as this goddess of the village just feeding everyone and kind of restoring the barrier and everything like that. They're safe now from the Maju. But I don't remember seeing the little blue hair girl at all during that sequence. Whenever, when all the kids were surrounding him and Ram was looking onwards, and you could see as well, just like Ram, you know, came to fully trust Suru in last episode to the point where she's willing to die for the man to protect him and go and go in to save him from this curse. She she truly cares for him and trusts him. You can see that building up in Ram as well throughout this episode, which I really have to see. But going back to what I was saying, I digress. The blue-haired chick was nowhere to be found when the kids were giving him little gifts and shoving bugs and random shit into the man's pocket. And I'm like, yo, that was the main focus of them going and confronting all these Maju in the first place after they found the main group of kids. What the fuck? Where, where is she? Where? And I don't know if it, they made it seem like all was well in the village. Maybe they just didn't show her. Maybe she's resting. Who the fuck knows? But her situation was volatile at the last, at the at the end of last episode when her Subaru and, and and Rem was there, and we don't see anything of her this episode. So I'm curious about that, and if that's just a small discrepancy, or if it's going to have some significance to come. Maybe that that one little Maju that's there, um, actually still has control over her, or maybe she's actually more involved in controlling them, which would be absolutely insane saying as well but she, she seems pretty innocent so i don't want to put any sort of shady evil tendencies on her but with all that said amazing episode dude every episode of ReZero is fucking incredible it's always fucking incredible i love this series so fucking much as you guys already know it's my favorite series to watch this season period just done my favorite fucking series um so 
it's hard to hold back. It really is hard to hold back from continuing forward, but you already know that we have to. Um, with that said, that's pretty much it. was a very straightforward episode. Really not much more to talk about or anything that I can really pick up on to theorycraft that I haven't mentioned um, already. So let me know your thoughts on the episode. Please check out and support the live reaction when it's, when it's out as well. Smash the like button here to show your support. And I'm out. Peace.